Hi everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us on the last and final day of the Elevate webinar series. Thank you so much for coming along. Um, so some of you probably know already, but my name is Kleena. I'm the Events and Client Success Manager here at Smart Simple. And today I'm joined by Angela um, Randell from the Coca-Cola Foundation. Angela, I know, is a great friend of Smart Simple. Um, we always love working for, with her and um, hearing from her. So we're so glad to have you with us today, Angela. Thank you so much. Um, just a few things, as you know, um, we will be doing a Q&A at the very end of this webinar. So please do submit your questions for Angela in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And without further ado, I'll hand over to Angela. Thank you, Kleena. All right, good morning or good afternoon or evening, depending on what time zone you guys are in. Um, I'm very happy to share with you guys um, some insight into um, my world of grant making. Um, so as she's mentioned, my name is Angela Randall. Um, I'm the Senior Manager of Grant Operations for the Coca-Cola Foundation um, and the Global Community Affairs Department of the Coca-Cola Company. Um, so with that being said, I will start to share my screen so you guys can see the presentation. Awesome. So jumping into our agenda, um, first we're gonna go over a little bit of the background so that you guys can kind of understand the grant making process that we have in Coca-Cola and why we decided to kind of make some of the changes and in the evolutions that we did in the past few years. Um, we'll go into kind of the phase one of our evolution, which was a grantee and applicant survey. Um, our phase two, where we reimagined um, a lot of our priorities and focus areas for the foundation. Phase three, some of our updated processes. Um, phase four, our smart simple system redesign, which um, was in support of these updated processes. And then just some of the general lessons learned, um, tips and tricks that we found along the way. And then as, as mentioned, we'll have time for some Q&A um, at the end. So jumping right into our background, um, the Coca-Cola grant making process. Historically, we have had a very, um, a very open process. So as long as anyone had access to the internet, um, they could basically get to our site and apply for a grant all across the world, right? Um, and we had open calls. So we never closed down the ability for a user to submit a request. Um, we just kind of processed them on a rolling basis. And um, a lot of times we had a pretty linear and siloed approach with reviews um, because they would basically come into us again from anywhere around the globe. And we had some automation and routing in place that would you know, kind of direct it to the responsible person either via their geography or by the subject area. Um, but then it kind of did a step-by-step -step process until it got cleared all the way through our foundation board. Oh, sorry about that. We also had 12 priority focus areas um, that some of those had a lot of subcategories. So there were a lot of areas that we claimed we were focusing on and that led for basically any type of project or request that people wanted to submit. They were like, oh, well, it kind of fits under this area. So it sounds like it's a good fit for the foundation, even though um, we had a higher um level of attention on some of them as opposed to others. Um, and even with that many focus areas, we still had some very limited opportunities. For example, with our disaster relief, we were focused on immediate relief from disasters. So we weren't really in the preparedness space um, or in the prevention space. And then also we, we realized that we were collecting some activities um, some outcomes from reports, but a lot of it was just the activity. So as we're trying to talk about measuring our impact, we weren't quite getting there with the way that we had done it historically. So kind of taking all of that into consideration, we identified that, hey, you know, we, we kind of have to change the way that we are processing these grants and the way that we function as a team. Um, some of the consequences that we identified were there were operational challenges and resource constraints. Um, our team is a pretty small team. We're at about 10 to 13. 
And the, the fact that we had these open calls meant that there were a lot of grants coming in, a lot of um, touch points with nonprofits and, and things to review. Um, unfortunately, we had a lot of pain points and frustrations, both internally and externally. Um, there was confusion from our nonprofits about what, what our true funding priorities and goals were. As I mentioned, we, we seemed to be spread out over such a wide area of topics that they weren't really sure what we were trying to accomplish with our grant making and where they might fit in. Um, and then also our reporting was limited to describing our impact in terms of the dollars given to communities and not necessarily the impacts of the programs that we were supporting. Um, and so we wanted to kind of shift and we basically had to decide if we were going to kind of start over with our process or if there was a way to build on to some of our current processes or um, add additional steps, things like that. So that was a kind of key part of the evolution was we decided that we kind of needed to start fresh. <laughs> um, so our first phase was we launched a grantee and applicant perception survey. Um, the primary goal of this survey was to really understand our nonprofit's perception of our process um, and even those who get declined, right? Um, not just those who we awarded a grant to. And their view of our process, although some of the pain points were fairly obvious to our team, I think that there was value in understanding those who um, may not have been as, as vocal in speaking up with some of their feedback, right? Or some issues that we might not have known existed. Um, so we used the Center for Effective Philanthropy to conduct the survey. We wanted to make sure that our nonprofits knew that their responses would be anonymous so that we could get really candid and helpful feedback. Um, and we did a mix of kind of some standard and custom questions. The standard questions allowed us to benchmark ourselves against other entities that were kind of using their surveys. Um, but then, like I said, we wanted to really get to the heart of some of the issues that nonprofits were having. So we did have some custom questions that were focused on either, as I mentioned, some of the feedback we might have received from other um, entities or just kind of digging into, you know, what what has been your biggest pain point with our process. Um, and then we provided a lot of functional data out of our system that would allow for result segmentation. So for example, we track um, our grants by, like I mentioned, the region and the country. Um, we also track them by the focus area. So whether it was a recycling program or a water program, things like that, where we could hope to identify maybe some best practices. So if a certain team or um, region has been getting consistently um, positive feedback, maybe there are some lessons learned that we can share with some of our other units to say, hey, you know, North America is really on top of it when it comes to reaching out to their grantees and making sure that they have an understanding of what's required from them. Let's try to get you know a lot of our other OUs to follow some of the same steps. Um, so we provided the announcement to all of our nonprofits so that they would know you know hey this is this is a legit survey um, it's trusted. Um, but then CEP as I mentioned did the launch and they sent um, reminders to everyone as long as the final report out. So our response rate, um, grantees, we had about 67% respond, applicants about 35. Um, and although I know that might seem a little low, considering that the applicants were, again, those that didn't receive funding, we actually had a really good response rate in terms of what CEP normally sees when they conduct these surveys. And so we had a lot of valuable information. Um, there was some free form questions, as I mentioned, where, you know, nonprofits could really just give us their views on how they thought we functioned as a grant making entity. Um, but some of the key takeaways were we, our staff was awarding significantly more grant dollars and reviewing a lot more grants than other foundations of our size. So, we were probably approving two to six times more on average in dollars. And we were reviewing about 12 and a half times more grants, again, because we had a very small team, but we had this large global system where we would get you know, thousands of requests each year. Um, our applicants did rate us particularly low on communication, perception of fairness, transparency, and feedback. Um, so we knew that those were areas that we really wanted to focus on improving. Um, 
And also just kind of across the board, the nonprofits really wanted a deeper relationship and more frequent inter interaction with our staff. So a lot more than just reaching out because they have an overdue report or because we needed to, you know, gather like banking information or things like that. They really wanted us to know about the work that they were doing and how the programs were, were operating. So after getting that feedback, um, we realized a couple of things. One was, again, we had a lot of priority areas that we wanted to kind of nail down. So we reimagined our priorities so that we have kind of six pillars, um, sustainable access to safe water, economic empowerment, climate resilience and disaster preparedness and response circular economy, our hometown, and then our employee giving. And we do still have kind of sub branches underneath these areas, but we really limited the focus. Um, so you can see our list that was um, our previous priorities. We were able to shrink that down and it, it provided us with a lot of benefits. Um, a few of those were our focus was more clearly defined, right? So not just for our team, but also for nonprofits. So there's a lot less confusion on what type of program is eligible or likely to be funded um, so that you know we're not wasting a nonprofit's time if they're submitting programs that really don't align with our strategy. And then it also allowed our team members to be responsible for a smaller scope of projects so that they could develop greater expertise on their areas. Um, so we have, you know, one person who is over the climate resilience space, as opposed to because we had so many areas, a lot of our team had to kind of be focused on multiple areas at once and kind of try to be a SME in those areas to evaluate projects. Um, and so that's leading to our are being able to have a lot more programs and partners that are closely aligned with our strategy, as opposed to, again, a kind of broader base of, of grant making. So next, um, we needed to update the processes by which we were operating. So the biggest change um, I think that the team loved was we went to an invitation only process for grant submissions. So um, instead of having the system open where anyone and everyone could submit a grant request. Um, now we basically were putting the ball kind of into our team's court where they're reaching out to nonprofits, um, nonprofits are reaching out to them, but they're kind of hearing the idea first and then deciding whether or not to move forward with a request to present to the board for approval. So we get, we're getting a lot more of those touch points early on and trying to help um, prevent a nonprofit from wasting their time submitting, again, a request that might not be in line with our strategy and what we were trying to do. Um, it also allowed us to move to a more trust-based philanthropy model. So because we are processing fewer grants, we can do larger and longer grants, right? We can do a bigger dollar amount to get a more impact. Um, we were able to streamline both the application itself and some of the reporting that the nonprofits have to do. We know that that is also um, kind of a big burden that sometimes a lot of the smaller nonprofits especially um, have issues with when it comes to trying to report out at the end of their projects. So we were able to kind of streamline that into, okay, just give us the information that is really critical for us understanding the project. Um, and of course, what we need for, for some compliance things. But other than that, we're not going to make you, you know, do things unnecessarily. Um, and then we also came up with our team being able to have a new commitment to building like relationships and transparency and dialogue with our grantees, right? Um, again, when we're getting thousands of requests a year, it's not really possible to have those closer relationships. But now we can, we can you know, be partners um, truly with some of our nonprofits and able to, you know, provide our insight, provide support beyond just awarding a grant. And then, you know, like I said, coming back later to kind of understand how it, how it worked. We also decided to have a more phased and collaborative approach to our program development and application review. So instead of that silo where, you know, it kind of it kind of gets submitted and then it passes from each reviewer to each reviewer. And sometimes, you know, we might have a question four levels of review in and then we have to kind of go right back down the, the ladder to get to an answer. Um, our, our team and the nonprofits are working together, right? So we're in the grant at the same time. We can see kind of if they are 
um, maybe missing some items that we would need in order for it to be a really strong program under our standards. Um, we can give them feedback real time instead of, you know, again, waiting until they have kind of completed the entire request and then submit. And, you know, if we catch a problem now, we have to go back. So there were a lot of a lot of benefits in in kind of working with them on projects. Um, for example, maybe some projects that if they had just submitted with their original thinking would not have have gone um, through to be actually approved. We can work with them like, hey, you know, we saw that you submitted for this type of project. With these, we typically like to see X, Y, and Z activities. You have X and Y, but could you potentially add Z to make it a much stronger program? Um, and the nonprofits were really appreciative of that feedback and wanted to you know, make their program stronger and be able to deliver on that. So we we're able to kind of work together to come up with the best programs and, um, and to basically have the most impact for the dollars that we're giving out. Um, we also implemented a MEL framework, which stands for Monitoring, Evaluation, and Learning. Um, and that just helped our team be a little bit more consistent as they're evaluating the organizations, the programs themselves, and the impact, right? Um, obviously, with a lot of different people reviewing, there's some subjectivity in there. But having this framework that kind of goes across all of our new priority areas allowed for there to be a lot more consistency. And again, that helps with the transparency and making sure that we're we're looking at organizations and projects all from the same lens. So our phase four was the system redesign, which was a huge piece of this process because again, if we're changing the way that we work as a team, we need the system to be able to support those processes, right? So we had a lot of changes to our Smart Simple system. Um, and thanks to the wonderful team at Smart Simple and Resolve, <laughs> we were able to get a lot of these um, done fairly painlessly. So um, closing the open call, right? A huge benefit as far as resources, time, constraints, all of that kind of stuff. So again, we're now on an invitation only basis. Um, and when a user goes in to submit a request, we have not only verbiage in there, but also we're having some some system mechanisms that say, hey, were you invited? You know, if so, provide a code. Otherwise they're not gonna be able to, to submit a new request. Um, so that helps because the team doesn't have to worry about getting a lot of unsolicited requests in their um, portal for review, and they can really focus on those projects that they are already working with the nonprofits on and developing really robust programs. We also decided to create new application types and forms. Um, again, this goes back to the whole knowing when to start over versus build on. Our applications were already pretty lengthy. And so we did not want to just kind of add new questions onto them or kind of change a few questions out. We really wanted to start fresh. So again, trying to make the application a lot more streamlined so that it's easier for nonprofits to understand and fill out, um, especially because you know globally our system is in English, but that's not the first language of some of our nonprofits, right? So making the application as seamless as possible um, we created new application types for these new programs that we were doing. Um, we were we eliminated a lot of questions that maybe were standard at one time in the industry, but that we weren't really getting value from, we never really reported on, or that just seemed kind of redundant when put together with some of the other things that we were asking. We, we needed to create new roles and workflows. Um, Again, because we have we now have this process that's a lot more fluid. And so it's not necessarily a step one, step two, step three. It's a let's go back, let's work through this, let's let's update this all at the same time so that we're basically getting to the best program possible. Um, and in order to have that kind of collaborative approach, we had to give um, new roles to our team and to the nonprofits, right? So that there wasn't kind of that cutoff of when someone could edit based on our old processes. We built out a couple of new UTAs um, to support this. So again, we have this 
phased approach, right? So we're, we're working through ideas first before someone even submits a grant. So we had a new UTA that we called Idea Manager where we can kind of document meeting notes, um, things like that from, from conversations as the team is working to, to discuss if this is really a project that we wanna fund. Um, but so that everyone doesn't have to maintain this separately outside of the system. You know, um, one of our team members isn't trying to keep track of all his notes in a notebook or the other one using an Excel spreadsheet. They can basically have a meeting with a nonprofit, come right into the system, jot down who they spoke with, what the notes are, what, what questions they might have about the project, um, any kind of future to-dos, and then that's all captured in the system. Um, which also helps with, you know, someone else needing to to kind of have an idea on the pipeline, right? We can look at how many ideas are in the system and look at kind of the level that they're at um, if, our, if the team is actually interested in moving on with them. And then we can have an idea of what's coming next so that operationally we can better prepare. We also built out a lot of new templates and automation. Um, so again, with these new forms, um, we really wanted to make sure that we were not just recreating or um, copying and pasting some of the old items the way that we did. We wanted to make sure that as we are trying to move to this new process, that all of the things that we're asking our nonprofits to fill out reflected that, um, and that the automation still supported that as well, right? So that we weren't trying to make things very cumbersome or manual. We still wanted to have the benefits of a lot of the automation that we did, but again, a lot more streamlined, a lot more clean and simple. We also needed to build out new reports and dashboards to track some of these things, right? Um, we were asking for new impact numbers that we had not asked for previously. Um, again, shifting from that activity of the grant and some outcomes to more of the impact. So if we're doing a workforce development um, program, we're not just interested in how many um, people were involved in the program or how many people finished, but what was the impact of that program? So going further, how many of those people that actually finished the program were able to you know, get a new job or um, attain a higher salary based on those trainings and things like that? So in order to capture that information, that means that we needed to you know, kind of create new fields and also link those to new reports and dashboards so that we can make sure that we were on the right page. Um, and then, of course, we we weren't going to completely just trash the, the old system entirely. So there were some existing areas that just might have needed a few updates, right? We didn't need to completely redesign, but we needed to update so that it made sense. Um, so like our grant manager, you know, the, again, there are new fields that we're creating that people might want to be able to filter on or sort by. So just making sure that we've kind of linked some of the commonly used tools in the system so that they're now able to track our new processes. Lessons learned. <laughs> so I will say that we had quite a few. Um, we, we really wanted to make sure that we were listening to our nonprofits and we weren't just kind of operating in a silo. So one of the things that we made sure we were we kind of planned into this um, redesign was that we're going to touch base back with them again, right? Um, we're going to conduct another survey. But even in the meantime, as we have implemented these changes, we're listening. So obviously, we this past year, there were some challenges because we decided that we wanted to go full steam ahead and so we were really um, building the plane as we flew it, right? We were still accepting grant applications while we were making a lot of these changes in the system. And so we would go live um, with, with certain um, pieces of the platform and say, okay, this, you know, this is changing now. Now you guys are gonna be able to submit XYZ directly into the system. Um, and so it was important to say, hey, we know that we're doing this and it's kind of a pain point right now. Once we can get the system a little bit more stable and, and you guys are able to go through the full process of how things should be and there wasn't maybe some interim steps that we had in place, like let's collect feedback internally and externally. Let's make sure that we were on the right path with this and that we are 
um, you know, not making changes that we think are going to improve the process, but that really aren't. Um, and so one of the biggest things with that as well was our go live, right? Deciding to implement as we as we were done with one piece, as opposed to waiting for a huge system redesign launch. Um, for us, although there was some of that pain point of having interim pieces of the program, I think that it it honestly helped a lot um, because what we didn't want to do was basically have people use an old system for like half of the year. And then once the new system was ready, completely switch them over. Um, that would have involved a lot more work on the back end to kind of standardize a lot of things. Like I mentioned, our forms were were very different. They had different questions, different um different metrics we wanted to look at. And so in order to really be able to report out on our full year impact, we needed to have, you know, nonprofits starting to answer these questions from the beginning of the year. Um, so for us, the the kind of um phased approach to go lives um, where we did sprints was really helpful. Um, it also allowed us to kind of keep track of, of the work, right? So as I mentioned, we were kind of soliciting feedback and, and listening to what, what people were saying. And so there were some things that we thought we knew how we wanted to build. Um, and then after hearing feedback, it's like, okay, we're actually making this process a little bit more complicated. Let's kind of shift gears. Um, I was able to, you know, kind of catch um, the team at Resolved. And, you know, there were some things that, you know, we had we had put in and then it's like, okay, hey, actually we're going to step back. Let's, let's re-imagine um, this page and, and make it so that we are putting in something that is truly helpful to nonprofits and to our team. Um, and so that was extremely helpful. I, I know that, you know, sometimes it it's not the easiest as you're trying to plan a project. Um, I mean, there's always scope creep and things like that. But when, you know, you realize like, hey, what we planned to do actually isn't going to be the best. Let's circle back and shift and kind of redesign a piece of work that was already, you know, kind of planned out. It can be a little difficult, um, but I think, again, having that kind of sprint phase where you can see things live and then make sure that you're on the right path before you have completely redesigned something and then are launching it for people to see for the first time, that was extremely beneficial for us. Um, I will also say knowing when to hand things over to the experts. Um, I am fairly technical and have been in the system for a while now, but I think one of the best decisions we made at the beginning of this was knowing that, hey, I'm not going to be able to con you know, configure everything and get everything built out in the timeframe that we want. Um, and I think some of, as I mentioned, some of the things we had initially decided on, you know, maybe there was a better way to go about it. So leaning on the experts who you know are in the system day in and day out more so from a configuration and who also have the knowledge of what some of the other clients have done and can you know make suggestions that maybe we haven't thought about was really critical for us as well um so being able to partner with smart simple and resolved and come to what we felt was going to be the best case system right the easiest for people to use um and what made the most sense as far as what we already had in place where we were not trying to redesign everything um, or start from scratch, but kind of building on what we had and, and creating new things to support the new processes. Um, sorry, let me um, think. We also, we also um, had, again, some, some pain points as far as I think expectations. Um, so just making sure to reiterate and level set um, with the team. A lot of people are not super technical and so they don't know everything that goes into a redesign. And so I think one of the areas where we realized we were maybe not as strong in the beginning and definitely picked up on was just giving timely updates and making it easy to explain what part of the process was going to be done and making sure that kind of everyone on the team was on the same page, right? So someone wasn't expecting this entire UTA to be in use 
um, or communicating that to a nonprofit and then having to go back and say, well, actually, it's not ready yet. So just kind of making sure that everyone on the team internally and externally was on the same page as far as what stage we were on and what was going to be required from them in addition to what was coming next. Um, so I would kind of share, hey, this improvement, you know, is in testing. It should be live by this date. And then this will be kind of the shift in the interim process versus our permanent process. Um, so just making sure that everyone is on the same page always. Um, again, kind of trying to limit scope creep as much as you can. Um, <laughs> I always tell my team that there's kind of an 80-20 rule. So if 80% of the users are successful in something that we've implemented, you don't try to config for the other 20 um, because you can never really config a system to that level of detail, right? You're going to slow it down. You're there, It's going to be virtually impossible for every individual that uses a system to have exactly what they want. Um, and over configuring only makes it more difficult when you do want to make some of those changes down the road. So for example, um, the more interdependencies that you have as far as your coding or your workflows, when you're trying to then peel those back or edit them, it just becomes a lot more difficult for you to, to go through that. If you have your system so tightly configed for each and every possible scenario <laughs> that you don't leave any room for flexibility. Um, so again, trying not to code for the exceptions, but you know, to really just have the system um, as simple <laughs> as it can be so that users can really benefit from it. Um, for example, we use the info um, tool a lot, the tool tips. But if you put a tooltip on every individual field, users will not read it, right? So again, just kind of knowing how much to build that out versus how much, you know, maybe we can accommodate for an additional training or a user guide or things like that, um, but not bogging the system down with a lot of that stuff. Um, so we had a lot of lessons learned. It was a really great process, um, to be honest. It was very informative, um, not just from a project management type of standpoint, but also from just learning even more about what the system can do. Um, it's one of the great things about the system. It's so configurable and it, you really can make it work for whatever you want to do in your system. But a lot of times it's you don't know what you don't know, right? So we discovered a lot of things that were actually going to be really beneficial for our team um, that maybe we just didn't even realize were a possibility. So again, if you guys are thinking of, um, you know, redesigning your processes or maybe just even refreshing or updating some of the things, right? Um, it's always good to kind of go through that at least periodically and see what possible ways you can improve, what things are new that maybe weren't an option before, but that are really beneficial now. Um, and it, again, for us, although we are still kind of going through it, um, you know, the system is, is stable for the most part right now. We do still have a couple of items that we're working on, more so on the reporting side. Um, but as far as the requests themselves, we have gotten to kind of a stable point. And we can already see that there is a benefit. Um, and for 2023, we probably processed half the number of grants that we would on a regular basis. Um, but we were able to do a lot more um, in terms of the dollar amounts and in terms of the impact that we're expecting. Um, so like our projected impact numbers for a lot of these areas are, are really amazing. We were able to do a lot of partnerships and leverage um, and all of that is a result of this new process. So um, definitely, you know, we'll, we'll have more to share, I'm sure, as we close out all of our numbers and things like that. But um, as far as what our goals were with the redesign of the foundation strategy, I think that these changes and the system improvements are definitely getting us to where we want to be. Um, so with that, I think we will start the Q&A. Yes. We will. Thank you so much for um, that presentation, Angela. Very, um, it's very great to hear um, how you got on. And I know that I definitely learned a lot anyway. So I know that we have a few questions in the chat box, but folks, we still have loads of time. So please do get them in there. So I'll start off here. Um, okay. You mentioned an open call. How did you get the word out? 
Were you flooded with applicants? And what was the process to move to invite only? Um, I know as well that you probably did kind of uh, mention this as well with kind of around the phase four with the introduction of Smart Simple, but I don't know if you want to give it more weight there. Yeah, definitely. Um, so yes, it it was definitely, I think, a a shock, right? Um, this is the way that the Koch Foundation has operated, you know, for for years and decades. Um, and so we started communicating early. Um, so even, you know, towards the end of 22, once we got our new strategy approved by the board, we shared that with, you know, our internal teams across the world so that they could start letting their nonprofits know. Um, we did change some of the messaging, not only within Smart Simple, but on the Coca-Cola Foundation's website and the Coca-Cola Company's site that links to the foundation. Um, and I think the the best thing we did there was was really being transparent with why we were making the change, right? So framing it as, you know, we don't want you guys to waste your time on programs that really don't align with strategy. It's not necessarily that we, you know, are trying to limit, you know, or kind of cherry pick which organizations that we want to work with, but it's like, we really want to be cautious of our resources and the nonprofits, right? Um, some of the smaller nonprofits, it's like you guys spend so much time on getting these applications in and ready and for it only to, you know, not follow, fall in with our strategy. That was really disappointing. And again, a lot of the feedback that we heard in that perception survey. So we definitely communicated, we communicated early and often as far as, hey, this change is coming. Um, we had a slight transition period where it was, you know, some of the things that you guys are used to. Um, being able to submit, you know, we, we'll try to accommodate some as we just transition you off, but really we're going towards this, you know, it has to be a program that we deem that really fits with strategy and that we're inviting you guys to, to, um, to propose or to submit. Um, a lot of people did reach out. Um, we have kind of a general email box that we, um, that we also um, I added like an out of office, right? So that people would just know from, you know, as soon as you're trying to send something to the foundation, I, I tend to get a lot of questions on, oh, is this project a good fit? Like, can I talk to someone before I submit? Or, you know, I'm working through putting this type of project in the system. And so even just, I think that communication, like, you know, hey, you know, out of due to the respect for your time and energy, you know, we're only accepting um, solicited proposals for grants. Um, so I think there was a definitely a bit of a shock at first and, you know, some people who were like, well, can I still submit? I already started working on it or the questions like those. Um, but in the end, you know, I think the, telling them up front was still always going to be better than waiting and potentially having them now upset because, hey, I thought that this program really aligned. Why did I get declined? Now I still want to talk to someone, right? But again, with our team constraints, that wasn't always possible. And so I think just being, you know, very clear and transparent up front. Some people did not like it that we were closing the call, but I think they they still kind of had to respect it and understand. Um, and I think most people, you know, really did understand and and were receptive to the fact that we we really just can't review that volume of requests if we kept the system open. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, phase four sounds tech savvy with the Smart Simple system redesign. Any specific standout ways you noticed it made the grant management easier compared to the old system? Yeah, um, I will definitely say for, for one example, just the collaborative nature and how we've set that up. So again, a lot of us can be in a grant at the same time. Um, that has helped a lot because again, we had multiple levels of review before a grant would be ready to go to our board. And if if I have a question at the fourth or fifth level, I'm now going back to level four, like, hey, did you ask this question already? Did you know what was the answer? Have we thought about X, Y, Z? And then a lot of times they're going back and then we're going back, you know, to maybe the first person on our team that the nonprofit had contact with just to then ask them a question, right? Because they're the ones that had the relationship. And again, it was kind of this very linear and siloed approach. So now we're a lot more of us, I think, are are directly interacting with the nonprofit. So if I have a question, I'm going straight to them, right? I don't have to send it through multiple layers on my team. Um, and that just saves time and, you know, just 
allows for a lot a lot quicker processing of the grants. Um, for example, if it might take you know a week to go through all of those levels and somebody wasn't looking at their email, now it's like you know the nonprofit is kind of aware of the the multiple levels of people on the team. We can ask them questions directly um, if we need a follow up. It, it's really easier to just kind of have a conversation with them now using this collaborative approach than it would have been before. Um, and also, again, we still have a lot of the automation in place, even though we have this new process. So being able to keep some of that or add some of that on, um, for example, although we're inviting, you know, users and they can't just log in and create a an application, um, you know, we have like reminder emails like, hey, you've been invited for this. You know, we have different things now set up that make this process a little bit easier so that it's not it's not a slowdown um, because we have to kind of suss the idea out and then invite them. It, it still is is a pretty um, straightforward and and smooth transition between re um, the initial like communication with the nonprofit and then getting it all the way to an actual grant request that's in the system. Perfect, fair. Um, how long did it take to make the changes in the redesign, specifically with the smart, simple changes to applications, reports, UTA, etc.? Um, so again, we kind of did a sprint approach. Um, we are still working on some of the the final steps, right? Like I wanted to do kind of a big cleanup because again, there's a lot of things we're just not using anymore that can be archived, so that we are saving some space and some um, processing time. But um, for example, the first the first stage, right, where we were we're building the idea manager UTA because that was going to be the new first step in our process. Um, we worked with the team. There was again because I do know some of the configurations. There was some some of the things that I was able to take on myself. But we worked with the team and basically had that live within like a month. So when we officially announced that, hey, yep, this is the new process. We um we had a summit for everyone in our PAX organization. And it's like, this is the change. You're going to see it live in the system, you know, starting this day. And, and this is kind of how we're going to move forward. Um, so certain pieces, I think using the sprint model, again, is really helpful because certain pieces of work, you know, might take a few weeks to actually build out a little bit of time to test, do feedback, and then actually make live. Whereas other pieces, um, for example, we are we're trying to have some priority in the environmental areas based on the the um the characteristics of that region right so if the water stress level for a country is really low we know that hey this is probably going to be a key area that we want to work in um and so just kind of consolidating that data from all these like national sources that have that have tracked and and done the science behind getting some of these like rankings um for these areas around the world Kind of standardizing that and getting it into an easy way to display in our system so that, you know, um, a person really just has to kind of click a button because we already know where the project location is going to be in the request. But now they can click a button and it says, oh, OK, the water stress, you know, ranking for this country is really low. The um, the access to clean water is really low, you know, things like that that require a lot more maybe customized configuration can take a little bit while longer, right? They can take, you know, a couple of months. Um, but again, we can we can keep moving forward in this sprint model and get things live and being used and tested and, and, and all kinds of things to improve the process. While some of the more complicated changes that we have that again, requires like maybe a lot of scripting or a lot of customization, we're still working on those, but they're not necessarily slowing down anything else. Right, okay. Was there a lot of training materials developed and or time spent for training sessions for users as you rolled out the product? Yeah, um, so I would say I would say a fair amount, right? Um, like I said, we kind of announced during this big summit, which was great because most of our users internally that were in the system were at that summit. So we, we kind of went through the whys and the hows, um, I then kind of scheduled regularly trainings to make sure like, okay, hey, this part is about to be live. This is what it means for you. These are kind of your responsibilities for, you know, each role um, that were going to be different from the old process. And then um, also just kind of developing some guidance like for the nonprofits, right, who this was going to be 
a different way than they have interacted with us before in a different way of working. Um, so one of those was was kind of built in, right? We wanted it to be more collaborative and to have more discussions with the NGOs. And so that was kind of a natural byproduct, right? So as our team is discussing ideas and projects with them, they're also letting them know about some of the changes in the system and what they may see that, that would be different. Um, but we're also um, very, I think, proactive in creating like training materials or resource guides. So, um, you know, whether it's kind of me doing a live training or taking screenshots and kind of creating an infographic, right? Like a little click cheat sheet so that, you know, people can have it readily available as, as they're interacting in the system. Um, we wanted to make sure that because we were making so many changes that any issues weren't because people didn't know what to do, right? So as clear as we could make things, um, it's like, yep, at this at this phase, you guys are going to do this, your nonprofit is going to do this, and then you'll move into the next phase where, you know, maybe someone on the ops team is looking at X, Y, Z, but the, the program director is looking at the actual, like, components of the project. Um, so again, a couple of different like user guides um, and even some for while we were in that interim phase, right? Because it's like, we didn't want to make a whole training on it when it wasn't going to be permanent, but at least some reference material so that they knew like, okay, in the interim, you need to do X, Y, Z in order to move your grant forward. Um, future state, it will be this, but for right now, this is what you need to do. Um, so we did want to make sure that we were communicating pretty clearly um, and again, not just with our internal team, but also with the nonprofits, because, you know, again, a lot of these changes were, were designed with the thought of really helping them, right. Improving our processes to help them to be more streamlined, to be easier and for everything to just make more sense so that there wasn't as much confusion. So making sure that we were also communicating those things to them, um, and just trying to be as as open and as much of a partner as we could be in the whole process. For sure, yeah, absolutely. Um, what qualifies someone to become invite only? So there's a number of kind of different things. Um, and basically it's not necessarily the organization. Again, it's more so the project. Um, so for example, um, under, like I said, under the water um, pillar that we have, right? Um, one of the our, our critical things is sustainable access to safe water, right? So if you if you are in a region that does not really have a lot of wash um, infrastructure in place, uh, which is water access, sanitation, and hygiene, um, that is going to show, number one, in some of those priority community numbers, right, where your region is going to probably be ranked really low just because of problems in that region. So that's already going to be kind of one factor like, okay, yep, this is probably something that we need to do because there isn't that level of infrastructure in place, or there may be infrastructure, but the ratings are still really low, right? Like there's not enough of the population that has access to clean water. Um, then we kind of look at what the qualifications are as far as your organization's experience in this type of work or um, the track record of different projects, things like that. Um, and that is not just kind of programmatic. It's also, you know, we might ask about the experience of the staff, you know, that's, that'll be running the project. Um, if there are going to be any other collaborating um, organizations that, you know, a lot of times some nonprofits will have like a technical partner if, for example, they're like digging wells or, you know, something like that. So we we look at it very holistically from like the the area that you're you're trying to work in, your organization, and then again, the project. So is this something that will actually have the impact that we're looking for? Um, for example, we used to have um, like in our recycling model, like beach cleanups. But unfortunately, you know, a lot of organizations would do, you know, kind of a lot of cleanups and they would collect a lot, but it wouldn't actually then end up making a difference as far as like what seeped into the ocean or things like that. So it's like, you know, do you have a program in place that will actually get to that out, that impact, right? So not just the output or the, we collected this amount of material. Did it actually stay out? Was it recycled after? Um, so we're looking at a lot more, I think, detailed characteristics of the program. And that's really deciding, okay, yep, 
this is something that we're we're kind of confident in moving forward with. And so, you know, we're going to invite you to submit a request. Um, and to be honest, everybody that gets invited does not end up making it through. Um, we do still have a lot of like our compliance and due diligence work that goes into it. Um, again, some of the stuff with the with the project, if it can't get there all the way, um, you know, we may put that off or say, you know what, we need to kind of reevaluate this program. Maybe we can restructure it with you guys so that it makes a little bit more sense. But um, but right now, it's not something that would really fit in our strategy and what we're trying to do. Okay. Um, Makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, we'll end on this one. So um, out of those lessons that you learned, what would something be that you would change? Would it be your go to live change to sprints? And how did this affect your business? Um, so yeah, I, I think we would definitely keep the sprints. Um, again, that for, for what we were trying to do, and getting everything out really fast. Um, I, I think we would have to keep that, but I would say again, probably the biggest headache was um, that we we were able to remedy. But we, if I if we could have started off communicating a little bit more and level setting those expectations, right? Um, because I think just that little bit of confusion and kind of uncertainty with the team on okay, so when is this going to be built out versus this and and different things like that. I think if we if we had um, more communication at the very, very beginning, um, we could have avoided some of those. And in addition, some of the things that, you know, we ended up changing after we had built, right? Um, because I can say one word and it might have a completely different meaning to me than it does to you. So just taking, I think, more time with our team to make sure like, okay, I'm saying for the reporting aspect of XYZ, we want to see this. Do, are you understanding the same thing and just kind of communicating what we all thought that the finished product would look like so that we're making sure like, okay, you, so, you know, for example, if I'm thinking I only need to build out these five extra questions on this one form, because that's going to get us to the heart of what we want, but really you want it like 10 individual questions built out, or you wanted something, you know, built out more as a table than as individual questions, like different things like that, um, where we would have actually kind of talked through what the what the look was going to look like and kind of those expectations um I think would have just made for a little bit easier in the beginning um but overall a lot of the a lot of the um the stuff I think we we did the right way right we we actually transitioned to the sprints so we weren't starting with that initially we were kind of doing phases where it was maybe like a, a chunk of work that was going to get done and tested but we moved to the two-week sprint um, which was a lot more helpful in in being able to identify any kind of hang-ups quicker so amazing okay thank you so much I appreciate you answering all those questions as well and hopefully we get to see each other again soon Angela I appreciate your time today um, thank you so much to everyone who attended to ask those questions. Don't forget that I will be sending out a recording um, at the end of the week. So tomorrow, I should have a recording out tomorrow anyway. So anyone who wants to watch this back. Um, I know for any um, smart, simple questions, if you do want to get onto us, please do contact platform solutions at smartsimple.com. I know, um, Angela, I don't know if you want to give out your information there about if anyone wants to reach out to you. Yeah, yeah, definitely. You guys can reach out if you have um, questions or if you guys are, you know, maybe going through something similar and would just like some more insight. Um, you guys can reach out to me um, on LinkedIn. Um, my name is Angela Randall there um, and I'm on the Smart Simple page um, or my email. It's A-N Randall. So A-N-R-A-N-D-L-E at coca-cola.com. Amazing. Thank you so much for your time. Appreciate it, folks. Thank you, guys.